a lifetime of hard work, children laughing in the kitchen, family photos on a restaurant wall, a legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation, like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 32, for broadcast on the 25th of April, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, NASA launches its latest planet-hunting spacecraft, a Tunguska-class asteroid barely misses the Earth, and a new era in antimatter studies. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has launched its latest planet-hunting spacecraft. The transiting exoplanet survey satellite, or TESS, was blasted into orbit aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. Falcon 9 is on internal power. EFTS is ready for launch. Falcon 9 is in startup. Ground gas close as it's complete. Stage 2 pressing for flight. LD go for launch. Stage 1 is at startup pressures. T minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. Mission. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Falcon 9 has successfully cleared the pad and is now on its ascent with the test spacecraft in its fairing. Now coming up in about 15, you're going to hear the call out that Falcon 9 would have hit max Q. That stands for maximum aerodynamic pressure. That is the point at which the rocket is seeing its highest stresses on its ascent. Vehicle has passed maximum aerodynamic pressure. You can tell by the cheers and what you heard on that call out, we have gotten to max Q. Coming up next, you're going to hear uh, the call for invac engine chill has begun. And that was it. That is where we chill in that Merlin vacuum engine down to operating temperature. Now coming up here shortly, you're going to hear three big events happening in rapid succession. The first is MECO, that stands for main engine cutoff. That is where all nine of the first stage engines are going to shut down. That's in preparation for the next step, which is stage sep or stage separation. That is where stage one will separate from stage two. Stage one will make its way back down to the drone ship. Stage two will continue on with tests to its orbit. And then you're going to hear second engine start. That is the ignition of the second stage engine. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Stage one is under the split. And that ignition. All right. We had a successful stage separation and a successful ignition of that second stage engine. Fairing now the fairing should be deploying at any moment. There we go. Now stage one is making its way back down to Earth. What we're going to see coming up pretty shortly is a boost back burn. Grid fins deployed. Grid fins have deployed. Both stages following nominal trajectories. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. Right now, stage two is going to continue to burn until T plus eight minutes and 20 seconds while stage one makes its way back down to Earth. There are two more burns coming up for stage one. The next one's going to be the entry burn. That's where we're going to reignite three of the stage one engines. And that burn is intended to slow down stage one's descent as it makes its way through that thick upper atmosphere. We'll be seeing that at six minutes and 29 seconds or so. We're hearing that stage two's burn is still performing nominally. Okay, stage two is going to continue to burn for about another three minutes and one minute until we see that re-entry burn. Now, after that re-entry burn, uh, stage one is going to continue on making its way down to the drone ship. And coming up thereafter will be the landing burn. That'll be the third of the three burns. And at that point, we're going to reignite that center engine, E9. And that'll bring us down to zero velocity, hopefully standing up tall on the drone ship. Continuing to hear that impact D is looking good. Turbo pump performance is good. Stage two continues to follow an almost. Stage one, that burn has begun, that entry burn. 
This room is going to go for about another 10 seconds or so before it shuts down. Complete. Stage one, shut down, shut down. Okay, as stage two continues to burn, we are getting the tests into a nice stage circular one. orbit where tests will then, well, stage two with tests on top will coast for about 35 minutes. Stage one is transonic. And as you heard, stage one is transonic. We're about 10 seconds away from that landing, landing burn. Note that the drone ship is situated approximately 300 kilometers off the coast of Florida. That landing stage burn started. stage has successfully landed on a fourth I Still Love You. This marks the 24th successful landing of a Falcon 9 first stage. And meanwhile, we've reached Seco, which is second engine cutoff. Stage 2 has shut down its first burn. Now, stage 2 should be in a parking orbit of about 250 by 250 kilometers. Stage 2 is now going to coast for 35 minutes or so. We will be relighting the second stage engine for a second time in order to raise the apogee of our orbit to 273,000 kilometers. That gets us to test this highly elliptical orbit where we will then deploy the spacecraft. We have reignited the second stage, and this burn's gonna last for about a minute. This is raising the apogee of our orbit so that we can drop tests off at a place where it can then properly begin to perform its own orbit raising maneuvers to get it to that point where it can perform its lunar flyby. We are beginning to throttle everything down, I'm hearing that everything is looking totally normal. And that cut off. So for about five minutes, the stage is going to coast with tests on top, at which point the payload is going to deploy. Now, the way that that works is there is what is referred to as a payload adapter that is sitting on the top of our second stage, and TESS is attached to that. It's attached via a clamp band, which is basically like a banded spring. We'll send a separation signal to Falcon 9, which will then open up that clamp band, and there will be four springs inside of that payload adapter, four compression springs that will give TESS a little gentle push to push it away from stage two. And after a while, a few minutes after that, TESS is going to turn on its transmitters, on its receivers, deploy its solar arrays, and begin its mission. We are now gearing up for spacecraft deploy. This is where we're going to separate the TESS spacecraft from Falcon 9, and TESS is going to go on about its own journey where it's going to be using its own onboard propulsion systems to raise its altitude and get it into its mission orbit. We'll be getting acquisition of signal as we pass over a ground station here shortly, and ideally we'll be able to see this signal, live on the screen. So, successful separation of the TESS spacecraft. TESS will follow in the footsteps of NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, which helped scientists identify over 2,600 exoplanetary candidates orbiting distant stars. It's thanks to Kepler that scientists now know that, just like in our solar system, planets are common throughout the universe. In fact, there are probably thousands of such worlds just beyond our solar system in our own galactic neighbourhood, some of which may be at the right distance from their host stars and of the right size and composition to provide environments similar to Earth, environments which could support life. TESS is using a gravity assist boost from the Moon to slingshot itself into a highly elliptical 13.7 day orbit around the Earth. This never before used lunar resonant orbit will keep the spacecraft extremely stable for decades, shepherded by the Moon's gravitational pull while giving it a full sky view. The Moon and TESS will be in a sort of gravitational cosmic dance, with the Moon pulling the satellite on one side, and by the time TESS completes one orbit, the Moon will be on the other side, tugging in the opposite direction. The overall effect is that the Moon's pull is evened out, resulting in what's expected to be a very stable orbital configuration over many years. In its current planned trajectory, TESS will swing out towards the Moon for less than two weeks, gathering data, then swinging back towards the Earth, where on its closest approach, it'll transmit the data it's gathered back to ground stations from about 108,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface, before swinging back out again. Ultimately, this orbit saves TESS a massive amount of fuel, as it won't need to burn its thrusters on a regular basis to keep on its orbital path. 60 days after launch and following tests on its instruments, the satellite will begin its initial two-year mission. The refrigerator-sized probe carries four cameras developed by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The spacecraft will survey a field of view covering 85% of the sky, encompassing more than 20 million stars. 
Within this vast visual perspective, the sky has been divided into 26 sectors that Tess will observe one by one. The first year of observations will map the 13 sectors encompassing the southern sky, and the second year will refocus activities on the 13 sectors in the northern sky. Tess will use the same transit method successfully employed by Kepler, looking at the nearest brighter stars for signs of passing planets. The probe will monitor the light coming from these stars, looking for a telltale dip in brightness caused by a planet passing in front of or transiting the star as seen from Tess's perspective. If the same dip regularly repeats itself over the same time interval, it's then possible it's being caused by an orbiting planet, and the length of time between each dip indicates the planet's orbital distance from the host star. Scientists expect that thousands of these stars will host transiting planets, which they hope to detect through the images taken by TESS's cameras. Scientists also want to measure the masses of at least 50 small planets whose radii are less than four times that of Earth, the so-called super-Earths. In fact, many of TESS's planets should be close enough to our own that once they're identified by TESS, scientists can zoom in on them independently using other telescopes to detect atmospheres, characterise atmospheric conditions and composition, and maybe even look for signs of habitability. And this is where KESS is very different from Kepler. While Kepler focused on mostly distant stars between 300 and 3,000 light-years away, all in the one section of the sky, TESS will concentrate on much closer stars, and 30 to 100 times brighter than Kepler's targets. In fact, the brightness of these target stars will allow researchers to use spectroscopy to study the absorption and emission of light to determine a planet's mass, density and atmospheric composition. Detecting water and other key molecules in an exoplanet's atmosphere will also provide scientists with hints about the planet's capacity to harbour life. TESS project scientist Stephen Reinhardt from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Centre in Greenbelt, Maryland, says this mission will open the door in a new era of exoplanetary research, examining individual planets and the differences between them. The targets TESS will find will end up being key subjects for research for decades to come. And while the primary goal of the TESS mission is hunting planets, Dr Brad Tucker from the Australian National University says scientists are expecting a few surprises in other areas as well. You see, the spacecraft uses deep depletion CCDs, or charged couple devices. They're designed to detect light over a wide range of wavelengths, including the near-infrared. And Tucker says that's important because many of the nearby stars TESS will monitor will be red dwarfs, small cool stars that emit less brightly than the sun and shine in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So TESS is the new kind of NASA space telescope for finding planets. It's, as I'm calling it, it's Kepler on steroids. So Kepler, the Kepler Space Telescope, found all of those planets around other stars. And TESS's big question is how many stars are in our local neighborhood? And the goal is to do kind of a, a solar census, really, of all of these stars around the sun, so these stars will be closer than Kepler, and to see how many planets are actually around these stars, and what is out there in our in, in terms of exoplanets. But it's more than that, isn't there? There's also quite an important stellar angle to all this, too. It is. See, one of the cool successes of Kepler, in my mind, was not that it just showed how common planets were and how common Earth-like planets were, but that it did things from measuring the pulses of the stars, what we call astroseismology, something led by University of Sydney and Tim Bedding to finding exploding stars, something I've been actively involved with. And TESS is going to do just this. Because it's looking over a greater patch of sky, it's looking at more stars, more sky. And it's also by looking at more stars, going to see more galaxies. So all of those cool things we got to see secondary, so to speak, in Kepler, all those other things Kepler did, TESS is going to do just more of. And unlike Kepler, everything that TESS sees will be seen at a 30-minute cadence. There will be an observation every 30 minutes. So Kepler was notorious that it would only download certain things and send it to Earth. And only those things that you chose to download, you would get to see that beautiful 30-minute light curve, those 30-minute observations. But the way TESS is designed is everything in the telescope's field of view will get that. So the plethora of data is going to be just not overwhelming, but exciting for how much we're going to get. Kepler was looking for mostly faint stars 300 to 3,000 light years away. TESS is looking for stars between 30 and 100 times brighter, but less than 300 light years away, fairly close by. But that's still over 20 million stars. That's right. That's still a lot of stuff. And there's still a lot of stars, a lot of galaxies, a lot of planets. So it's, you know, we have to realize that Kepler's big goal was just to see how common planets were, because we didn't have a good an answer to that question. And it, and it showed that they are common. And now that they know we are common, we can start looking for those things and 
greater detail. And that's what Tess's goal really is. We know all this stuff now happens. Let's get a better understanding and more detail of it so bigger telescopes like Hubble or telescopes on the ground can really look and analyze those objects in greater detail. It's an exciting time to be an astronomer because in a, in a year or a little over a year, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched and we'll be able to look at some of these things with this great resolution and in the infrared. It's a booming time for astronomy, especially here in Australia. Well, you just use the infrared term, and that's important because TESS does go partly into the infrared. It's not just the visible part of the spectrum it's looking at. Exactly. In fact, if you actually see what the lenses of TESS look like, they're designed so they block out the blue light. They want to go to the red colors because they want to really focus on these red dwarf stars. So red dwarfs are one of the most common stars in the galaxy and the universe. You know, over 60, 70 percent of stars are red dwarfs. So you want to look really for that red and infrared light. It gets you around some other problems like things like dust. And we want to characterize how is the universe at those red colors and then use other telescopes to look at blue or optical colors and really get a full picture of what is going on in the neighborhood. Focusing on red dwarfs for a planet hunter has got to be a bit of an issue because although it'll be easier to see planets that are orbiting red dwarfs, there's less likelihood that those planets could support life, even if they're in the habitable zone. So it's a bit of a uh, balancing act there, I guess. It is, and that's one of the interesting things when we talk about things like Proxima Centauri and Proxima Centauri B, the planet mm. going around it. it there was just observations that showed that Proxima Centauri had a lot of flares, and that would have irradiated any you know life form on it. So the, you know there ends up being this question of we need to understand two things. Where can life exist? And part of that is actually looking at extreme places here on Earth for extremophiles, and then what is out there and trying to see where they match up. And, you know, I think it's a very at least interesting that we can ask these questions because, as you know, two, three decades ago, we didn't really know about many planets outside the solar system. And, you know, we didn't have a grasp of how common they were or how likely they were. And now that they are so common, we're lucky that we have this opportunity to see the extreme nature of planets and potentially the extreme nature of life. I will never forget the day I first read the, the paper on the discovery of Pegasi 51. That's That was just so incredible when I when I read that. Exactly. And when you think about it, it's only essentially a generation ago. Yeah. It's not even 30 years. And then that's, you know, we, we just feel that it's commonplace now to have all this stuff, but it's not. And it's really things like Kepler that revolutionize and just, you can see the plots of known planets and you can see how, you know, Pegasus 51 and then there was a few and then all of a sudden Kepler was launched and boom, the, the lines just go through the roof because so many were found so quickly and with more and more facilities turning on, it's just going to keep skyrocketing. With that near infrared ability that TESS has, does that mean it should be able to spot hidden brown dwarfs as well? That's right. So it should be able to find some brown dwarfs if it comes from the cross of the view. Now, what we have is what we call the ecliptic or the plane of our solar system. It won't focus too much on the ecliptic, so we're less likely to find ones in the ecliptic, but if there's ones outside of it, it will. And also by, again, looking for, in my area, interesting in the supernova, by looking for supernova towards the infrared or the red infrared, they're actually less likely to suffer from dust, which blocks out part of the light, but actually you get a better measurement. And for the special type 1a supernova that we use for cosmology, actually gives you a better measurement of a cosmological distance. So it's, it's great. That's Dr. Brad Tucker from the Australian National University. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A Tunguska-class asteroid has come to within just a few hours of crashing into the Earth. Even more concerning, this massive space rock was only spotted 21 hours before its nearest approach to Earth. The asteroid, named 2018 GE3, was first detected by the University of Arizona's Catalina Sky Survey. Just hours later, it passed in front of the southern constellation of Serpens, just 192,000 kilometres from Earth and less than half the average distance between the Earth and the Moon, a veritable cosmic near-miss. The space rock was travelling at a speed of 29.8 kilometres per second relative to Earth. Estimates of its size, based on its light reflectivity, are ranging from 48 to 110 metres wide. Amateur astronomers who have seen it say it's as bright as a 13th magnitude star. Astronomers estimate it's up to four times the size of the asteroid which airburst above Tunguska in 1908. 
That space rock was somewhere between 60 and 190 metres wide, air bursting about 10 kilometres above the ground with the force of a 15 megaton thermonuclear explosion. The massive blast flattened more than 2,000 square kilometres of eastern Siberian forest, knocking down some 80 million trees like matchsticks. The Tunguska event measured five on the Richter scale, triggering seismic stations across Europe and Asia, with light from the blast visible a third of the way around the world in London, allowing people in the British capital to read at night without artificial lights. A similar though much smaller airburst event in February 2013 involved a 20 metre wide asteroid airbursting over the Siberian city of Chelyabinsk, causing over a billion dollars in damage to buildings with flying debris and shrapnel injuring more than 1,200 people. I'm Stuart Gary, this is Space Time. Physicists have undertaken the most precise measurements ever done on antimatter. Scientists with the Alpha Collaboration at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, successfully conducted the most accurate measurements ever taken, revealing the spectral structure of the antihydrogen atom in unprecedented detail. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, represent the culmination of three decades of research and development at CERN and opens a completely new era of high-precision tests between matter and antimatter. The humble hydrogen atom, comprising a single electron orbiting a single proton, is a giant in fundamental physics, underpinning the modern atomic picture. Its spectrum is characterised by well-known spectral lines at specific wavelengths, corresponding to the emission of photons at specific frequencies or colours when electrons jump between different orbits. Measurements of the hydrogen spectrum agree with theoretical predictions to a level of just a few parts per quadrillion, a stunning achievement which antimatter researchers have long sought to match for antihydrogen. Antimatter hydrogen is exactly the same but opposite to regular hydrogen. It's composed of a nucleus made up of an antimatter version of the positively charged proton, which is the negatively charged antiproton. The antiproton, in turn, is orbited by an antimatter version of the negatively charged electron, which in the antimatter world is the positively charged positron. Comparing matter to antimatter and conducting measurements in such a way tests a fundamental symmetry called charge parity time, or CPT, invariance. Finding any slight difference between the two would rock the very foundations of the standard model of particle physics, the cornerstone of our understanding of the universe. It could even shed light on why the universe came into being at all, and why it's made up almost entirely of matter, even though equal amounts of matter and antimatter should have been created in the Big Bang. Problem with that, of course, is that as matter and antimatter annihilate each other as soon as they come into contact, the universe should have ended almost as soon as it was born, leaving nothing behind but a scattering of photons. Until now, however, it's been all but impossible to produce and trap sufficient numbers of delicate antihydrogen atoms and to acquire the necessary optical interrogation technology to make serious antihydrogen spectroscopy possible. The Alpha team makes their antihydrogen atoms by taking antiprotons from CERN's antiproton decelerator and then binding them with positrons from a sodium-22 source. Next, it confines the resulting antihydrogen atoms in a magnetic trap. This prevents them from coming into contact with matter and annihilating. Laser light is then shone onto the trapped antihydrogen atoms, their response measured and finally compared with that of hydrogen. In 2016, the Alpha team used this approach to measure the frequency of the electron transition between the lowest energy state and the first excited state, the so-called 1s to 2s transition of antihydrogen, with a precision of a couple of parts in 10 billion, finding good agreement with the equivalent transition in normal hydrogen. The measurement involved using two laser frequencies, one matching the frequency of the 1s, 2s transition in hydrogen and the other detuned from it and counting the number of atoms that dropped out of the trap as a result of interactions between the laser and the trapped atoms. The latest results from Alpha takes the antihydrogen spectroscopy to the next level using not one but several detuned laser frequencies with slightly lower and higher frequencies than the 1s, 2s transition frequency in hydrogen. 
This allowed the team to measure the spectral shape or spreading colours of the 1S-2S antihydrogen transition and get more precise measurements of its central frequency. The shape matches that expected for hydrogen extremely well and Alpha were able to determine the 1S-2S antihydrogen transition frequency to a precision of two parts in a trillion, a factor a hundred times better than the 2016 measurement. The Alpha experiment's Professor Niels Madsen from Swansea University says the precision achieved in this latest study is the culmination of more than 30 years of research. Although the precision still falls short for that of ordinary hydrogen, the rapid progress being made by the Alpha team suggests that hydrogen-like precision in anti-hydrogen and thus unprecedented tests of charge parity time symmetry are now within reach. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study claims eating nuts could avoid atrial fibrillation, rhythmic irregularities or flutters in heartbeat which can cause stroke. The findings reported in the journal Heart are based on a study of 61,000 people in Sweden aged 45 to 83. Researchers found the more nuts people ate, the lower their risk of atrial fibrillation became, with three or more weekly servings reducing their risk by 18%. The scientists also found that nut consumption can also help reduce one's chances of heart failure, although those results were somewhat less conclusive. A new study warns that the marine heat wave of 2016 caused such a catastrophic die-off of corals in the Great Barrier Reef that it's transformed the ecology of around a third of the entire reef, which may never fully recover. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on research mapping the heat exposure and coral death right along the Great Barrier Reef's 2,300 kilometre length following the heat wave. Scientists say many of the corals died immediately from heat stress, while many more died slowly because their algae partners were released in response to the heat. Bleached corals and those exposed to the highest temperatures were more likely to die, and the northern third of the reef was the hardest hit. The types of corals present have now also changed on hundreds of reefs. And it's not over yet. Severe bleaching occurred again in 2017, and the entire reef will continue to decline until climate change stabilises. A new study has confirmed that human migration out of Africa coincided with a dramatic reduction in the size of mammals wherever people went. And researchers say that trend is continuing, meaning in a couple of hundred years' time, the largest terrestrial mammal could well be the domestic cow. By looking at the distribution and size of mammals over the last 66 million years, researchers found that as humans spread around the globe, there was a continuing and very definite trend for large animals to become extinct, leaving only their smaller relatives behind. Scientists found an especially striking reduction in the size of mammals at around the same time as humans developed long-range weapons. The findings are reported in the journal Science. Paleontologists say a 205-million-year-old jawbone discovered in Somerset most likely belonged to a giant 26-metre-long ichthyosaur, as large as a blue whale. Ichthyosaurs are prehistoric aquatic reptiles with a body plan similar in appearance to modern-day dolphins. The metre-long fossilised jawbone was compared to other ichthyosaur specimens, with the nearest match being a previously studied 21-metre-long shastasauroid ichthyosaur. The findings, reported in the journal PLOS One, may finally bring closure to an ongoing debate in dinosaur circles about several similar fossils which scientists had suggested may have come from stegosaur and seropod dinosaurs. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favourite podcast download provider. 
Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 